today I want to talk to you about uh, the Reflect and Unsafe packages. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to talk to you about this green dot. And uh, this crudely drawn green dot is how I first really got into looking at uh, the Reflect and Unsafe packages. And as you've all probably figured out now, this green dot is not just a green dot, it's a, a, a state in a finite state machine. Um, or a uh, step in a workflow, depending on, uh, on how you look at it. So uh, a couple of years ago, we were building on, out a system where we needed to um, run a state machine. And rather than just sort of building this you know, as code, we had a, a few constraints on it. Um, so we needed to do sort of parallelism where we could look at uh, a team and sort of extract all the users from the team and do operations on them. Uh, you know, and we needed to add some branching logic to this. Uh, and sort of the, the reason why um, this had to be its own system was that uh, we needed at least one semantics on the workflow. And because we were calling external partner systems, we wanted to be as close to once as possible. So we had to sort of checkpoint after each state and, uh, and do it in a way where we could write arbitrary workflows and not sort of have to uh, impose too much work onto the developers. Uh, so the, the trick here is that um, each step had its own arbitrary arguments, right? Something might need a, a handle to a database and something else would need a database and uh, access to an external system. And so it was this part that sort of got me looking uh, more at Reflect. Now, the thing about Reflect is that you're all probably already using it, right? If you use, you know, encoding JSON, right? This is, uh, this is using Reflect under the hood. So marshalling and unmarshalling or similar libraries. Uh, anytime you sort of see this, you know, empty interface argument, there's a good chance that it may be using Reflect. Uh, and uh, struct tags, right? So the, the JSON tag here that will change the output format are only accessible through Reflect. So anything that sort of expects you to set struct tags is, is using reflect. But you're also already using unsafe. So let's look at a small Go program. Uh, I'm not positive, I think this might be the smallest Go program you can write. But uh, if we look at the depths on this program, um, you know, you can see there is, uh, there's unsafe, right? It's, uh, it's part of the runtime. And if your code, like further, if your code is sort of interfacing with um, many external systems or data, then you may be using unsafe indirectly as well. But in, in both cases, it starts and ends with types. Um, you know, reflect and unsafe are, are in some ways sort of two sides of the same coin. Uh, you can't have reflection without types to reflect on. And you can't be un unsafe unless you're bypassing type safety. So uh, to look a bit at the type system, uh, you know, if we call OS open, we get a, you know, a pointer to an OS file, right? And we can assign that to file. And uh, this is something that you know, the, the, the compiler can check for us. And we can do this at compile time. And it's you know, um, safe in that way. And we know that file is a pointer to an OS file. But uh, if we then go and assign file to uh, an interface type, so read seeker, um, this too is something that the compiler can do at, uh, or that the compiler can do. So it can be done at uh, compile time, right? Because we know that the type of OS file has the required methods, so we can assign it to an interface. Uh, but looking at type assertions, uh, this is something that the um, Compiler doesn't know what type is in the sort of the concrete implementation of, of RS. So what well, we can see right here in the example that it's an OS file, you know, it, it could be something else. So to do this type assertion, you, you need to find out what the, what the static type is underneath and then uh, and do the check at runtime. Similarly, um, you know, we can convert a read writer to uh, an I.O. reader, that part can be done in compilation. But to actually do the type assertion, 
from a writer to a read writer where we're saying we also want the read method on this. Uh, you know, we have to do that check at runtime too. So when you're dealing with interfaces, you know, every, um, every value or every variable will have its, its concrete type. So it's uh, like for OS Open here, you know, on top we have a, uh, a file type which is uh, static. But then when we put it into an interface, we have our further type, our, our dynamic type, which, um, you know, in this example is writer. So, uh, so for interfaces, we have two, two types associated with uh, a value. And the Go runtime needs this type information for any kind of work with interfaces. So it's, it's stored right in there, you know, in your program data. And uh, it's intrinsic to how using interfaces work for type assertions and, and type switches. Um, and it's also key to how Reflect works. Uh, this data is, can be omitted. So if you are not doing any type assertions and not using Reflect, then the compiler can just not include any of the, uh, this sort of extra method metadata for any of your types, you know, and shrink things down a little bit. <coughs> So let's look at uh, Reflect a bit. The two main entry points into Reflect are value of and, and type of, right? And so you give them uh, the empty interface and you get back a Reflect value or a Reflect type. Um, and both of these hold you know, information about the type or the value passed in. Uh, type of is just a shortcut to get the type off the value, so you could do value of dot type and it would be the same thing. Uh, and the cool thing though is that if you can assign something to a variable then you know it has a value and a type, right? So maps, slices, arrays, channels, funks, all of these, you know, they all have types and so you can inspect and manipulate them with reflect. So uh, a few examples. Um, excuse me. So a few examples. Uh, here, you know, we can take a, uh, a channel of chan bool and um, use reflection to sort of pass it in, reflect that value of, and get the value for it. And then we can look at the, the, the value here and get the, the type of it and then use the, get the element. And this has different meaning based on the, um, the type you're looking at. But in the case of a of a channel, you know, it sort of strips off the chan part and gives you back the bool. If it was a, a pointer to something, you'd get the, the underlying type. And then we can get the zero value of this bool and send it on the channel and close it. So this channel, if we range over it, would return false and then close out. Uh, so another example here is, you know, again, functions are, uh, are our types so we can you know take this instance of a function and get the value of it and then we can build up arguments to it so what I've omitted here is that you can inspect the type of this function and see the the types of all the arguments and the types of the return values um, but then you can call the function with the arguments given uh, and sort of here's you know the 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 sort of big example for reflect is is looking at a um, a value and you know marshalling it in uh, in some way. So here we've just got a, uh, a a struct with you know name and value fields, and one of them has a struct tag on it, where we can override the the name of the field for output. So when we get down into the the loop here over the fields, we can do a, a lookup of of struct tags on each field, and if there's something defined for our our specific keyword, then uh, you know, we can override the value. And so this would print out name, colon, a name, val, colon, a value. But um, because all of this, you know, type information is just data uh, and the both reflect and uh, interface sort of manipulation, look up types or look up your value and then look up the type for it, uh, you can create types at runtime. So here, you know, we can build up an arbitrary struct type, 
you know, with, with struct tags and everything, and, uh, and then assign a value to it, and, or you know, instantiate an instance of it, and then assign a value, and, uh, and marshal it out. Um, and this is possible as well for maps, pointers, channels, and even functions. So, coming back to the uh, big old state machine executor and thinking about functions, what we decided to do here was to use uh, reflect on each of these states and the functions that implemented them and uh, implement dependency injection with it. So we were able to take each state and sort of wrap it up nicely, have our um, a sort of pool of available things that we could inject, find the right things, put them into the functions, and then uh, wrap this up um, in, uh, in reflect.makefunc to make new functions that sort of hid this complexity and, and had a standard interface for all of the steps. So the state machine itself was just sort of able to walk through or the state machine executor and call uh, the, the step function to move through it. Um, yeah. So moving on to unsafe. Everything that we've talked about with um, you know, types and, uh, and how interfaces are used at, at runtime, uh, unsafe takes all of this and just lets you ignore it completely. So um, given this example here, if we have two structs, A and B, uh, B has an additional, you know, an additional field on it, right? So these types are not equal, and we can't uh, do a type conversion from, you know, from a, a pointer to B to a pointer to A. Even though you would think, well, why can't I just take the, you know, the name field? It's both at the start of both of these structures. And with unsafe, you can if you want to do bad things. So you can wrap your um, you know, you can do a conversion of your pointer to B into an unsafe pointer and then convert this over to A and this will compile, correct? Or will, it'll compile and you'll be able to then access A dot name. And uh, since, the, since the two types have memory alignment that's similar in the beginning, then things work out in this case. But it, it's not a good idea, right? Because if you, when you start dealing with types, you know, you, you have type safety there for a reason. And if we be, then begin to convert types where the, uh, where the alignment is off, you know, and we deal with slices and everything, we can just get into uh, uh, funneled C land. Um, but what is it good for? Well, calling syscalls is a, uh, you know, primary use of unsafe, right? So, um, Besides unsafe.pointers, we have um, uint pointers as well. And this is something that unsafe is able to work with as well. So you can convert these to unsafe pointers and then convert them back into arbitrary structs. So with a syscall, you know the, the shape of the argument that the system expects and you know the shape of the data that's going to come back out. So you can define structures that match the system call that you're making and, uh, and cast between those two. Uh, and, you know, and point at the memory handle that the operating system has given you back. Uh, another good use for unsafe is reflect. So reflect needs unsafe. Uh, when we look at the, the passing in an empty interface into a reflect call, the first thing that it does is it gets an unsafe, you know, it, it turns it into an unsafe pointer and then converts it into uh, the type that matches how interfaces are stored in memory, where we have a, a pointer to the, the type information of the, uh, the type of the interface and you know, the data itself. But here's the, uh, the, the cool thing about unsafe, is uh, this is all of unsafe's code without the comments. And there's no assembly behind this or anything, it's just this one file. And so, these end up just being sort of uh, hints to the compiler in the runtime to let you escape from all of the, the type checking and do all of your unsafe things. So uh, let's wrap things up with one last visit to the state machine. Um, 
so we had built our dependency injection system, and you know, on one side we were able to implement uh, functions for each step, and then on the other side we had the executor that was just walking through steps, and you know, every step would be able to return the next step that it needed. And then in the middle we had this nice, you know, um, package that the different uh, developers were able to largely ignore uh, until there was a problem, right? If code in either side broke, we had this big sort of mess in the middle. And sort of this is the twist, right? Uh, is that all of this reflection became very difficult to understand. So um, my first takeaway for you is to not use reflect for runtime dependency injection. Uh, it's just not a good fit. Uh, particularly when it comes to debugging problems and you end up with reflect sort of all through your stack trace and it makes it uh, much less clear to read. Um, following from that is to keep the flow of control in one direction. So we had uh, reflect going in, in in two cases, right? We were sort of figuring out the arguments for a funk and, and calling the funk through reflect to inject the right arguments, but we were also wrapping it in a new function which had a, a preset signature. So things were entering and leaving reflection, and again, it makes the stack trace larger and more difficult to uh, understand. So with that said, uh, reflect ends up being best for reading. So and not just like, not just struct data and, and fields on structs, but even inspecting function signatures, you know, just using, uh, looking at data or values and then doing something with that, sort of you know, either displaying it or marshalling it. But of course, Reflect is also, it's good for writing data, right? So if we want to unmarshal and, uh, and take something like JSON and put it into a structure, you know, this is a, a great use case as well. And it's uh, well understood and comprehensible enough that it shouldn't be a, uh, a pitfall. But you know, avoid, uh, writing via function calls or, or perhaps doing channel sends. Uh, and finally, you know, don't use unsafe directly. We have a type system for a reason. So, thank you.